have had a sleepless night and decided to turn on the TV, and you happen upon some channel, doesn't matter what channel it is, but whatever channel it is, there happens to be someone who is calling themselves a prophet. You ever seen those people? Come on now. All right, now the discerning ones, the ones who have discernment, the ones, by the way, who read this book, know better. It's the ones who are what I call the marginal Christians. The marginal Christians are those who are, they've got, excuse me, I'm going to be colloquial, they've got their butt in a seat on Sunday for church, but they never, ever go beyond church to open up the word. Now, I'm not condemning you. If that's who you are, I want to urge you today that if that's who you are, I'm simply saying, make it a note to self that being in church is wonderful and hearing a message is wonderful, but your growth and your relationship with Christ depends on you opening up this word. And when you have really opened up the word and you're reading it and you're sitting then in a church where the word is being rightly divided, there's no mistake that when you turn that TV on and you see someone saying they're a prophet, your discernment alone, but added to that, the word of God confirms everything you need to know. So for the benefit of those who really want to know, I'm going to talk today, you knew this was coming, those of you who've been listening, you knew this was coming already. I'm going to talk about the prophet's message today. Who is a prophet? What is a prophet? What is a prophet? Oh, let's be clear, it's not spelled F-I-T at the end. <laughs> P-H-E-T, because there are many prophets for profit. You can figure out which one comes first. But I thought, you know, I'm going to take the, the liberty, and I'm also going to take the chance, because I try to bring messages that encourage spiritual growth. I try to bring messages that bring understanding. And believe it or not, there are so many people walking around. Here are my air quotes, forgive me who call themselves Christians, but they are so messed up in their beliefs, either because they grew up in an acculturated frame or they think they can figure it out and everything is good. Now, I'm telling you, not everything is good. Our uh, mark, if you want to have something to look at, is the Bible. I'm not interested in personal interpretation, personal doctrine, but my goal today is to make sure that even if you're here for the first time or listening for the first time and you don't come back, you'll at least say, I got something out of this service. I got to understand what this word prophet truly means, how it is applied, how it is grossly misused and completely misunderstood by the modern church. So let's begin, because I'm ultimately going to end up with Jeremiah. I want to give you a little forewarning. But let me begin first by talking about what this prophet is. Who is a prophet? What is a prophet? So, if I lined up three biblical persons, and, uh, you know, you have to add some color here. I'd like to find some people who fit the personage, but I'd say, for example, if we could find some people that lined up with, oh, the possible, what we would imagine, for example, for Abraham to look like, what Abraham would look like, and we'd have one person over here, and then we'd have a Moses type, over here. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say Moses out of Egypt on the backside of the desert in appearance over here. And then we have a Jeremiah over here. And if you had to pick just upon looking at the person, you'd probably pick the guy with the whitest, longest beard, who is the most crooked and hunched over with the, with the smallest eyes, because he can barely, that must mean that he's wise. That's how we, that's how we determine by, by observation, by perception. You look, you look like a prophet up there. I, don't, I wasn't pointing at anybody because I can't see you, okay? But what if I told you that all three of those men that I just named were prophets? You say, well, but, but Abraham wasn't of the same line of, of prophet as Jeremiah, but the Bible in Genesis 20, it is a Bimelech that says regarding Abraham, that he's a prophet of God. So that's your first place where it's used of a person in the Bible. Now you may say, well, that breaks tradition because prophet in the Bible is 
generally associated with and you go down the line. You must look at the first occurrence, where it occurs in the Bible. I just gave you Genesis 20. So that's the first occurrence in the Bible, truly. If you go into the New Testament and read the book of Jude, Jude speaks of Enoch and says Enoch also prophesied. Well, we have no record of it in Genesis, but it's safe to presuppose that if Jude is recording that, then he did without record. So I'm giving you the first without record is Enoch, who, according to Jude, prophesied. And then thereafter, the first occurrence, Abram, is referred to as a prophet. Now, why I'm setting the stage and developing this is because in order for us to make doctrine, we must look at how the development of this word progresses. First of all, in its first use, in its first true use, the word, the Hebrew word, nabi, is used of a pot that is boiling over. And erroneously, by the way, people assume that that means that a prophet is just spilling over with everything. If you think of it this way, a prophet of God is much like, if you remember, Dr. Scott explained how we could explain Jehovah, Yahweh, as the hose being pinched up, ready to be released. Do you remember that example he used? Make that application that that is what it is. It is God's word having been placed in the heart of man, usually through the mouth of God to the man in his, in his ears or in a dream or in a vision. But it's the same concept as God wanting to release his word. And that does not mean prediction. At some point, I'll explain as I go down this pathway, at a later time, there were other Hebrew words added. This word wasn't unique. Other words that came to be like seer, which is often mistranslated in the King James. And another one, another Hebrew word is to gaze upon. So there were three words that sometimes were used interchangeably. But m I would like to make this point that if you looked at the life of Abraham, you'd say, but he never bubbled forth with any predictions of something. Oh, well, that's where you're wrong. God gave him a word and told him he would have a son. He would have a son of promise, that he would be father of many when he was father of none. God gave him a revelation, spoke to him directly, changed his name, and everywhere he went, ridiculous as it was, he was father of many, but he was father of nobody at the time. So we must understand how this word comes to pass, how it evolves. So in Exodus, we have Moses being called up to the burning bush. And God says, come here, Moses, calls him by name and gives him a commission. And Moses says, I can't speak. I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. I'm not eloquent. Bah. Of course, he didn't say that latter part. That was a Scotism. But I'm sure he must have been thinking it, though. And God says, finally, in his, you know, okay, I've had enough of you. Really? You're going to give me excuses? I'm calling. You're going to give me excuses? Okay, Aaron's going to be the mouthpiece of this dynamic duo. You, he will be the prophet, and you will be unto him like God. You will give him the direction. He will go speak. So right there in those two lines, you can see very clearly coming from God's mouth that God is explaining what the concept of a prophet is. A prophet never has an independent word that he just merely thinks up that's on his heart. It's always something that comes from God. And please keep in mind, there was no Bible. There was no written word. So when we speak of prophecy, we need to be very careful to not confuse Edgar Cayce foretelling a foreteller, and the prophecy that is of God. You see out of God's mouth how he says, you will tell Aaron, so you are to him like God, and he will be the prophet that goes. He's the mouthpiece. Effectively, that only lasts for so long because eventually Moses does become the prophet. He must go up, and he alone may talk and receive the messages from God and deliver them to the people. They were not independent messages. 
Now, if you keep moving through the scriptures, you find something very radical is about to happen. While the kingdom is still together, so the kingdom is not yet split, Solomon is not dead, there are many prophets. And interestingly enough, when Solomon dies, which was foretold that when Solomon died at the death of Solomon, David's son Solomon on the throne, the kingdoms would divide. At the death of Solomon, you'll notice that prophecy and prophets take on a new dimension that they did not have before. That being said, let me jump back a little bit. In between the likes of Abraham and Moses, in between the likes of that and the divided kingdom, right there you have Samuel. And Samuel, believe it or not, it sounds kind of nutty, he actually starts a school. I know it sounds crazy, but it's in the Bible. He starts a school for prophets. But contrary to what one would think, it's not like sign up here to learn how to prophesy and you know, you'll be able to prophesy. School of prophets, you have to remember that in that day, there was still no abundant written record available to all. So how did people communicate? One teacher repeating, sometimes it was in song, that's how, ch that's how young Jewish children to this day are taught. To this day, in song, they repeat their prayers in song so that they can sing the song and they learn the song and then that becomes the prayer that then after a while they drop the song and they recite the prayer when they're old enough and they're, they've remembered it enough. So, in this school of prophecy or prophets, it wasn't like sign up to learn how to predict and foretell. It was a teacher who was giving out the word of God and repeating the word of God and the will for the, peop for, for the people, for God's people at that time out of God's word. So when Peter in the New Testament, 2 Peter says, no prophecy of scripture is of private interpretation. Take that to the bank. I have heard enough of people saying, well, what this prophecy really means, and they go down some really crazy paths. The worst one, by the way, I'm sure you know. This is the worst one. It's the one that taps on the most base of society, whom much and many of the body of Christ are a part of. It's called greed. Those that come prophesying your riches, and my point is, that's why if you read 2 Peter, he says, what is their point? There'll be many false teachers now. He doesn't say false prophets. He says false teachers. And for what? To make merchandise out of you, to profit from you. So I have no sympathy. I get letters all the time, and people will find me wherever I am out in public saying, well, why don't you, why don't you tell this person? Well, I don't have to. See, if they were really reading their Bible, Gosh, you're going to hate this condescending tone that I'm using right now. But if they were really, really reading their Bible, they'd read what I read about false prophets. You know how many times I've heard people say, the Lord spoke to me concerning you. I had a, I had, I've had many prophecies over me, by the way. Pro prophelize. I've had many of them. <laughs> and there's nothing worse than somebody who says they come in the name of the Lord. They haven't read the Bible. Uh, the test of a true prophet, by the way, is if what he says comes to pass. That's, that's the metal test right there. Okay, I had some, and he is, he's a lunatic who has a ministry, prophesy over me and say very, very, very mean, very unkind things about me. Obviously, he hasn't read this part of the Bible. Deuteronomy 18 says very clearly, Deuteronomy 18:20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Oh, bring it on, God. <laughs> I don't ever do this here. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> That's what I said. I feel terrible that they don't read the full, you know, if I was somebody coming out and saying, well, I'm a prophet, as they, dis, as they define themselves, I, I, I'd come to you, if, if, even if the Lord told me to tell you something, I'd come shaking in my boots. I'd come probably wearing extra depends that day. 
knowing the possibility that if, if it's truly not coming out of my mouth because it's not coming from God, I could be wiped out in a millisecond. I mean, that's the way the Word of God should be treated anyway, with such care, because what we're really talking about is your souls. What we're really talking about is where your focus is going to be. And in many pulpits, there are many preachers, by the way, I'm told or informed or I see for myself who rail against this all the time. Unfortunately, what they do, now I'm, I'm looking at it from the other side of the equation, is they're not saying, here, please, look for yourself. They come across as little dictators wanting to rule and manipulate and, and by cutting down other people, which they may have a right to do if they're true men and women of God, but in the process of doing so, showing from the Word of God, which I just did, giving an example, showing from the Word of God to equip you, not to aggrandize myself. I've said to you many times, I think of myself as nothing but dirt. I'm not stuck on myself, but just dirt that God would deign to use. Now, whether, whether I'm offending people or not, I had one, and I call him a lunatic, one lunatic prophesied over me, and boy, oh boy, the things that were said, and oh, it's such grand, they're very dramatic. Oh, okay, I'm going to leave that alone for a minute. So, after a while, I started to, and I said this to you many times, after a while, I, I, I took up the, the banner, listen, I have good connections with God. If you have a message, tell him to tell me, because I'm pretty connected. You know, I don't need it from you. Now, is it possible? No, but, but wait a minute. Is it possible in this day and age that we might have a real concept of prophets and prophecy completely misconstrued and if rightly understood possibly exists? That's what I want to, I want to tug at for a minute. So as I'm marching through the Bible, I begin to see a pattern. And I take all of the prophets, all of the prophets after the kingdoms divide and take a look at what they're saying. No prophet ever stood at any given time. You can mark my words, you can record them, you can say, I want to quote this back to you. No prophet ever stood on a platform or in a prison or anywhere else speaking for God that he did not call the people to repentance. He did not call the people to their wrongs and to point them to, if you do not repent, judgment is imminent. It is there like a hammer. It will fall. Now, when I come into modern times, this is where I get completely aggravated because the ones that come, that say they come in the name of the Lord, they're not calling men and women back to repentance. They're not even preaching what repentance is. In fact, if they do, by any means, they're preaching a corrupted version of what repentance means. We get our English word repentance and unfortunately from the Latin, which has a lot to do with the mea culpas and the, the, the uh, beating oneself down. But in the Greek, that Jesus spoke to the people, repent. John the Baptist, speaking of Jesus, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And Jesus himself, he said, metanoia. That is change, turn your mind. Turn from your way of thinking to my way. And that can only be done when you make an about face towards God. Now. If there be a person on the face of the planet calling themselves a prophet and having a platform, the first thing I would call you to say, that's the, that's, that's the first message. That's really of God. And they don't, by the way, you don't need a Bible for that. We all need to be called back to that every day, not just once a year when we think, oh, here comes Easter. We better repent now because we see that cross and we know what it means every day. That's not to make you feel bad. That's to make you know we serve a very gracious God who lets us come daily knowing our shortfallings. And we're allowed to come every day and say, Lord, like Matthew 6 in that beautiful prayer, we're taught to pray, to ask for forgiveness, not just of our brethren, but ask of our Heavenly Father first and foremost. So when you put that all together, you start to see a picture is shaping up. Back to the prophet. I actually have a message. So I'm, I'm showing you these are the dimensions of prophecy. When you get into the New Testament, I want you to see that God has not changed his way. 
think of what I just said regarding the Old Testament prophets, that it is indeed as though God used man as a conduit or a vessel to communicate his message. Go right to the end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, where John is exiled on the Isle of Patmos. The Lord Jesus appears to him. He falls on his face as if he was dead because he's, he just can't look. He gives a brief description. And then Jesus says, John, what I'm about to tell you, what you see, write it down. There is the last prophet and last prophecy. Now, why I say that? Of the foretelling of the plan for mankind was given in the book of Revelation. The book of Hebrews says and opens with God in diverse times and sundry ways. He spoke to the fathers by the prophets. He hath in this day, in these last days, spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. So there begins the debate. If that's the last prophecy concerning the world and the, the end times, then what about the words in Corinthians where it t talks about people prophesying? Should they have their heads covered or no? And this is where it, it gets fully interesting. Perhaps our understanding of what Paul is saying is so messed up to begin with that we have just taken it for granted that we use that reportive meaning, prophecy, as one who foretells. But what if I said to you, consider the fact they had no New Testament at Corinth or at Rome or at any other place. The message, these are just letters that were being delivered. There was no New Testament as we have it. And Old Testament, there may have been a few copies of the Septuagint in scroll form circulating. So th put it like this. There's only one prophet that I see in the, in the New Testament who delivers a message, and that's Agabus. He delivers a message regarding Paul and his calling, not for personal gain. So when you look at the, the prophecy concept in the New Testament, it is not divination. It's not fortune-telling. Now, are there people who have the gift, as Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 speaks of those gifts, and some have them? Yes, but I want you to think of it this way. How can a man, how can a man or a woman claim that they're a prophet of God when they don't even know the Word of God? Because if they knew the Word of God, I just read Deuteronomy to you. Don't say that you're saying or speaking in the name of the Lord if you're not. Don't come and speak lies because God's word says death is upon you. You're dead. Oh, this, is, this is serious stuff for me. I want you to know this is really serious stuff. This has been under my skin for so long that I find it is such an abuse on people. And the ones that come saying, well, I have a word or I have a message, it's always for, per you notice, they always come speaking good words to you. You ever notice that? You ever hear a prophet say, you ever hear these people that come out in their pseudo, whatever they are, titles? You know, I think you're going to get a blister on your foot today, and it's going to hurt like hell. <laughs> and you over there in the back of the room, you ate too much iron. You're going to have trouble going to the bathroom. <laughs> Do you ever hear them say that? Their messages are always the same. It's always peace smooth, it's all going to be okay. Now, you may say to me, gosh, this is not the message that's going to build the church. No, let me tell you something. Jeremiah, who I got great strength from through this week, it was like I sat there and scales fell off my eyes. In order for reformation to truly come to the church, there must be proclamation, and the proclamation must be the gospel message. Nothing else, nothing else, that's all. After telling you all this, let's look at the prophet Jeremiah. I want you to go to Jeremiah with me. Jeremiah, who uh, means Jehovah lay at the foundation or Jehovah has appointed, and he served during some very tumultuous times, Assyria to the north, Egypt to the south, Babylon to the east, all in turmoil. And what is very relevant, he served through multiple kings as well. He served through, in fact, I believe he started his min ministry during the reformation of Josiah's kingship. Josiah was that young boy king, but he brought reformation. He was a good king. And then everything else after that was lackluster and went down the tubes. But he served 
at least through three to four kings. One is dubious and questionable that he even was on the throne for more than a few days before they assassinated him. Nice batch of people there. But some of the important things that I just want to point out, that, okay, Jeremiah maybe is a little bit different. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were preachers, kids, priests, and, of course, prophets. But there were some other people in God's book. Just take note of this as a sidebar. I think about it's very small, but Amos is a prophet. He plainly says, I was a herdsman. I'm not from a special lineage. I don't have any special background. You, go, you begin to read the background of some of these, and they're just really average people for the most part. And I keep saying to you, that's God's specialty, taking the average or the base or the low, and that's the stuff God works with. So we have the picture of Jeremiah's calling here. In chapter 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. So right in the middle of Reformation. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, even unto the 11th year of Zedekiah. And I said there may be one or two kings not named here because of their short tenure and sometimes a misspelling on one of the king's names. And it says, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, that is, unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, and please write right beside this verse 4, the divine call, and it was a divine call. No man came and said, you will do thus and so. The Lord spoke to him. The Lord spoke to him and said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. I underlined all the these in here because God's being very specific. Before I, before I formed you, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You know, when people say, I, I'm a prophet. Okay, to whom? Because God always is sending his prophets somewhere. To whom? Even the reluctant ones like Jonah, go and preach in Nineveh. He was deemed a prophet, by the way. There's always a destination. There's always a recipient for the message. It's not ambiguous. Well, just keep crushing some of those balloons down. I am. Now, if you think this is strange language of being where he's, God is speaking to Jeremiah, saying, before I formed thee in, in the belly, I knew thee, same language pretty much if you just make a note, you can check it later. Same language in Isaiah 49, 5 is being used, that now saith the Lord that formed me in the womb to be his servant. Same language, by the way, that the Apostle Paul will use in Galatians 1, 15. Same idea, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, and so forth. So it's safe to say that all these, but specifically here, chosen... Gosh, the missing message of the church. I'm sorry, there's a thousand messages in here. I'm trying not to kill one, and probably I'm killing about a thousand. God chooses you, not the other way around. Here's Jeremiah. I cannot speak, for I am a child. So Jeremiah has two objections, the, the lack of eloquence and the lack of experience. This is what I find miraculous. The Lord said, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Now, this is interesting because what God reveals is not that Jeremiah was being humble. I'm sorry, you may say that. He revealed his lack of faith and trust in God, whom the Lord calls, he does enable. That's why, by the way, when Jesus said, the Great Commission, go ye into all, and people would want to talk about how the Lord's commission is to go into all the worlds, but that could not be carried out 
Had they not gone to that upper room on the day of Pentecost, whom the Lord calls, go into all the nations, he enables. You wait there, you tarry there until you're endued with power. That's what that means. That's why when I say to you, whom the Lord calls, he enables. If you say you're called, if you tell me you're called, I don't want you to start doubting whether you are or not. Don't do that on me. Oh, well, am I called or not? No! You say Christ is your Lord and Savior. You're called to his kingdom. You're called to serve him. Then don't say, well, how, what am I going to do? He'll enable you. Each person has different gifts. He'll enable you with those gifts. Sometimes he gives you gifts you didn't even know you had, or maybe you didn't have, and he gives them to you. And then you can say, wow, God did that for me. Okay. Don't say I'm a child. You're going to go wherever I tell you to go, and you're going to go speak to whomever I tell you to speak. Is this not the same repetition like Moses? Moses, I'm slow of speech, slow tongue. I want you to think about this because this is rather staggering. Moses was trained as a prince in Egypt. He wasn't slow of speech. He was trained in eloquence. Now, not as much as perhaps the Greek orators and the Greek scholars, but he was a prince trained, trained in Egyptian ways, which means it was quite refined. No. Not that you can't speak, you don't trust God. Not that you can't speak and you're slow of tongue. Believe me, he wasn't slow of tongue when he got down there and he slew that one on the ground for touching his Hebrew brethren. Was he slow of tongue then? <laughs> See, you've got to read between the lines and weave out some of the stuff that, that we humans bring into life. You know, there's nothing worse than this, than limiting God. If he has called you to something, if he has called you to fulfill a purpose for him, why do you abase him in saying, well, he's called me, but I certainly don't have the goods to make it? Well, who said you need the goods? If you could provide the goods, why would you need God? The miracle is he gives us, he supplies our need to get done what needs to be done for his purposes. So there's some good parallels here. This is one of my favorite ones. So the one I just gave you before, we, we said his, he has a divine call. Jeremiah sees himself as a dubious candidate. Not very likely. I could pick a whole bunch of dubious candidates in the Bible. And it seems that those are the ones that God loves. Don't be afraid of their faces. And I, it's interesting that he put their faces. Why? Because he's going to go have to talk to some very mean characters. Don't be afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Same words, by the way, spoken to Moses. I am with thee. Same words spoken to Joshua. Same words spoken by the prophet Isaiah. We could just keep going and say, God repeats himself through the Bible. I'm with you. If I called you, not only will I enable you, but I'm going to be with you. Now, do one thing, that word deliver, same word that we encountered in Psalm 91, verse 3. Remember that word deliver, to snatch up, to rescue, which also carries with it the bursting of bonds. And God will make good on that because Jeremiah ultimately will be thrown in prison, falsely accused, being told to shut up and quit preaching. God will burst him out of those bonds as well. I love the way little subtle things are woven in there and you go to the big picture and you go, wow, God is faithful to fulfill his word. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Again, I want you to see an established pattern that God seems to use with the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6. When Isaiah came in contact, he saw the Lord in that sanctuary. But in Isaiah's case, he said, Woe is me, a man of unclean lips. His response was, I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm dirty, versus Jeremiah's just, I lack eloquence, I'm not qualified. But I want you to see the same thing God does over and over again. The hot coal touches the mouth of the prophet's lips, Isaiah, to, clink, to symbolize that he is cleansed. Here, God touches the mouth of the prophet. Ezekiel's told to eat that scroll, it'll be sweet bread in his mouth. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I want you to see God's pattern. And for us, it is our responsibility to taste and see every single 
opportunity we have with God's word. We take it in. That's why I said to you, be careful how you interpret prophecy, the meaning of the word. It is to take in God's word and then to be able to bring it forth again with a force like Yahweh's force being ready to be released. Now, if you understand that all right, you get a much clearer picture of why I get angry. I have thrown shoes at the television. I have tried to call fire down from heaven. Yes, I've even in my mind committed murder against some of these because I say, doesn't anybody get this? Doesn't anybody understand how disgraceful this is and that people are lured into this somehow? It's a great trapping for those weak ones. You know, the weak part of the flock, those ones that like to go find interesting grass and weeds to go graze on, wander off and suddenly here are what Jesus warned about. False prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing, et voila, there they are. So we have his call. We have that he's a candidate. Here's his commission. And then the Lord says, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. Now, this verse, the last two, to build and to plant, should be kind of parked. They belong to a different subject because as recorded in this book, Jeremiah did not do any building or planting. He may have bought a field in Anathoth while he was incarcerated in prison, but he didn't do any building or planting. That is for a later message that my dear late husband so brilliantly explained. A church in another land is, or, or the church of God, in another land is birthed that happens to have a lot to do with Jeremiah. But that's another message. So I just want you to see, he's given a call to the nations over kingdoms. God doesn't just willy-nilly say, hey, get out there and go talk to people. You know, in TV land there, look, I'm looking at myself right there on the screen, but I'll look at you over there. You know, if there's one person watching me or if there's 10 million people watching me, if I'm going to say something that has any value to you, if I were to elect myself a prophet, for which I believe every person who stands as a pastor also has the word of God in them, bringing forth the word of God, it flows out of you. That is the concept of the New Testament prophet, by the way. So I just gave you the definition. If there's anybody who stands and says anything else, turn the dial, shut it off, or you keep exposing yourself to more lies and more lies and more lies, and sure enough, you will find yourself searching for the lies over the truth. The truth is so hard to handle. The truth is something that is just so, it is so devastating to the soul to recognize that no matter how good you've been, no matter how bad you've been, sin is sin. We want to just somehow rationalize, and if we could just exploit that for a minute, but rather I'd say to you, the call out of the prophet's mouth, if there is one. Turn back to God. Get right with him. Get in the word. Ask him for forgiveness. Now, I don't just tell you that like I'm telling you and I'm looking down saying, but I don't. I do every day, and sometimes it's, hour I've told you, hourly. God, forgive me, because, and I can give a long list, beginning with I have staff, and I have, you know, so in dealing with people, you expose yourself to certain temperaments and certain situations, and Man, I might have murdered in my mind five times already today. <laughs> Lord, forgive me for real. It's like that. Now, because Jesus said, if you think the thought, it's as bad as the deed. Let's just settle that right there. So I'd like you to note right here that he gave him a destination over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down. Now, having said that, I have enough time I want to read you the comparison between a real prophet of God and a fake one. We're going to read two different places. Let's begin with chapter 27. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck. I want you to take note that that is like um, what you'd put on the ox, a crossbar with some rope or strap made out of wood and rope. And it's dual, not just one, it's dual. Put it around your neck. Picture him wearing 
a double toilet bowl, kind of. <laughs> the round part, but it's attached, kind of like that, because the younger generation may not know what a yoke looks like. And it's just saying, just saying. I'm not, not that I'm that old either, but yeah, all right, never mind. We'll leave that alone. So make the bonds and yokes, put them on your neck. Send them, send word to the king of Edom, to the king of Moab, to the king of the Ammonites, to the king of Tyrus, to the king of Zidon, by the hand of the messengers which come to Jerusalem unto Zedekiah, king of Judah. Command them to say unto their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall you say unto your masters, I love this, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, my great power, and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. That is, by the way, God's foreign policy. Okay? He gave it to whom he wanted to. Love it. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. I want you to notice that. Nebuchadnezzar is seen as evil, but God's calling him his servant to carry out and do his bidding for him. And the beasts of the field have I given to, to him also to serve him. And all the nations shall serve him and his son and his son's sons until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. It shall come to pass that the nation and kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword, with famine, with pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. God is not saying, oh, brethren, would you please kindly? He says, if you don't obey what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to blot you off the map. That was first book of Scott right there. Therefore, hearken not ye to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, ye shall not serve the king of Babylon. It's the direct contradiction of what the prophet is telling. No, you're going to serve. For they prophesy a lie unto you, to remove you far from your land, that, you sh that I should drive you out, you should perish. Now, here's what is being told to the prophet. You put this yoke on your neck. You send messengers telling all of these kings, I made the land, I'm giving it the land and the beast to King Nebuchadnezzar, to do, basically to do my bidding, to carry out my purpose. Don't listen to the prophets, don't listen to all these people. They're telling you lies, saying you won't serve the king of Babylon. I, God, am speaking, saying you are going to serve the king of Babylon because I said so, and if you don't, you're going to be blotted out. For they prophesy a lie unto you. Now, verse 11, But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those I will let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, they shall till it. I want you to see they're not going to have any animals to use. They will have to. In other words, this is going to be a hard, long trip. They'll dwell therein. So this yoke represents a light burden juxtaposed with if they don't obey and they don't take that yoke, something else is going to come upon them. I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, and by the way, he is referred to as the puppet king. He wasn't really a ruler. He was just flim-flam. He was all over the place. And he paid for his flim-flam, middle of the road. He paid for it dearly with his eyes. Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people, and live. Now, jump down to verse 14. Therefore, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak on you, saying, We shall not serve the king of Babylon. They prophesy a lie to you. You think I'm bad. Jeremiah will keep going on this subject over and over again. For God's telling the prophet to tell them, For I have not sent them. Yet they prophesy a lie in my name. They're, they're coming as I come in the name of the Lord. da 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 and the Lord said, da, 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 da. That's why I said, I'm warning you. I'm warning you, some of you, and I said, some of you, who just, you just wander off, and that sounds so plausible. Some say, I come in the name of the Lord. They did it in Jeremiah's day. It's still going on today. God says, I haven't sent them. 
He also spake to the priests and to all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, hearken not to the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house shall now shortly be brought back again from Babylon. Don't listen to them, because they were carried away, not all of them, but most of the vessels that were in that uh, house of the Lord were carried away. Now the prophets are saying, oh, don't worry. They're not going to all be taken away. They're going to remain here. Not everything's going to go, and they're going to be brought back. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. If those items were brought back, perhaps worship could resume, and the priests and the prophets would be back in business. Don't worry about it. I got your back. Meanwhile, they, they, no, they don't got you back at all. Hearken not unto them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Wherefore should this city be laid waste? Now, we're getting to this because all of this prophecy is given to Jeremiah. Imagine he probably looks pretty silly wearing this yoke around his neck, telling all these things. But he says, but if the prophets, but if they be prophets and the word of the Lord be with them, let them now make interces intercession to the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and at Jerusalem not go to Babylon. Let them pray for that. If they're really who they say they are, let them start making intercession right now. For thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, concerning the sea, concerning the bases, those are all the things, all the articles that remained, the vessels that remained which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took not when he carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. <laughs> this is going to be good. Yea, thus saith the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house, in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah and Jerusalem, they shall be carried to Babylon, and they shall stay there until the day I visit them, until I decide, God saying, that it's time. Now this is God speaking to the prophet, delivering a message. Here comes Mr. Hananiah. He's the prophet too, you know. Next chapter. Listen to what he says. And this is why I said, if you don't know the word of God, don't blame me. And if you don't know the word of God and you're duped and you're standing before God on that day and he says, depart from me, I never knew you, don't say nobody warned you. This is a tough message. It's serious stuff. But the example's right here. Anything that contradicts God's word, blatantly contradicts it, go the other way. Here we have Hananiah, the same year, in the fifth month, Hananiah, the son of Azar, the prophet, which was of Gibeon. And you should know no good can come out of Gibeon. Those Gibeonites were the ones who lied to Joshua back there in Joshua 9. Gibeonite. Next time you see somebody you don't like, call him a Gibeonite. <laughs> Just a Gibeonite. That sounds good too. Hananiah, the son of Azar, prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me, listen to where he is, in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people. So the whole congregation is gathered now. Everybody's gathered. This is just a few months after the Lord spoke to Jeremiah and gave him that decisive word. This guy comes and he says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now you can imagine the people sitting there all listening, priests and the people listening going, oh, like, oh, hope, oh, I've broken the yoke. I could almost hear maybe even some clapping, some hallelujah, right? Hmm. Within two full years I will bring again into this place all the vessels of the, Lord, of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. I'll bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives. I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. He's saying he received this message of God. This is what the Lord said he was going to do, which, by the way, contradicts, first contradiction of what God told Jeremiah, the prophet. First contradiction. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord. Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. One of these days I'm going to preach a message on Amen. But until then, he's saying, So be it. So be it. Make it happen. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon to this place. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and the ears of the people. 
the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil, of pestilence. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that he's truly sent of God. Why? Because every prophet was come warning of impending doom, of war, of destruction, not of peace. And Jeremiah knew that. Now you can say he's calling him on the mat under the guise of saying, Amen, make it so. Because you know, all the prophets that have come before you, they all came speaking of one thing, like me. God's message, not of peace. Mm. This is the good one. Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and he broke it. He just took that thing off of his neck and he broke it. Like, I could imagine, I don't know, probably a little bit more than pencil breaking. You'd have to be pretty strong to break it. But he broke his yoke. That could be its own message. <laughs> Hannah and I speak in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way, because he knew that contradicted the word that the Lord had given him. Not so, not so, not so. So if you know the word of God, and somebody says, this is what God says, and it's contradicting God's word, you know that's a false prophet. Just, that's just the, the, the self-evident checkbox right there. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke off of the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, God now is talking to the prophet. He says, go and tell Hananiah, saying, thus saith the Lord, I love this, thus saith the Lord, thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. The yoke you could have had would have been easy to bear if you would have just bowed your neck and been obedient, but now a greater yoke is going to come, come upon you, one that is unbreakable of iron, so heavy and so burdensome. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, I've put a yoke of iron upon the neck of these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I've given him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Every time someone says, I come in the name of the Lord, bringing these good and smooth words that are so overcomforting that you just, you just feel like, oh, all, every, every yoke is gone, it's all gone, and it's just going to be fields of flour, and cotton is flying, and the sun is shining, and birds are flying, and the birds have no food, so they can't make any droppings, and it's all good. <laughs> Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off, off the face of the earth, this year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. And he did. He misled the people. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Let me just say this, because this sums up the, the totality of the message, which is juxtaposing these two men gives us the example. I gave you the background for the, at least a basic understanding of the word prophet and what a prophet does speaking for God, not independently, not with some personal little uh, tidbit to prosper you so that you might have prosperity in your life, which is the famous uh, trend nowadays. But look at these two men. One received from God, and it was a harsh word, and he must have looked like a fool coming in and announcing with that thing around his neck, looked like a double toilet bowl with some rope around it, saying, and thus saith the Lord to the nations. He must have looked like an idiot. Illustri By the way, that's an illustrated sermon right there. He was wearing it. When people say, is that legitimate? Yeah, he was wearing it. In fact, Jesus did an illustrated sermon too when he took the child and said, consider this child. I'm just against the nutty things people do. But this one is pretty good. He was wearing that thing demonstrating to these who will come under God's word and listen to what the prophet's saying. The yoke won't be that heavy to those who refuse to listen. The yoke's going to be heavy and unbearable and unbreakable. Now, the one, it seems self-evident. 
Ahananiah is not the only one to be a false prophet in this book. There's another man by the name of Shemaiah. There's another Ahab. There's another Zedekiah, too. There's a handful of them that he will condemn, and he'll catch them right in the midst because their whole prophecy over and over again is peace, peace. God said peace, but God did not say peace. He said destruction. He promised and gave a word to Jeremiah that 70 years would be the time that the people would be carried away into captivity. So what God's word does for me right here is it shows me the straight stick and the crooked stick. And it gives me the option, once I know the truth, to say, I love that straight stick. That's God's word. I will cleave to that word. I will make sure that I know it so I'm not misled versus this crooked one here. Well, it's still a stick, but it's crooked. Not saying what God's word says, not declaring. And gosh, I sure wish that God would just take that word out of Deuteronomy. He did it here. But for those people who are today preaching lies and misleading people, I can only tell you as a spiritual leader and the leader of this church, and as a person who cares deeply and profoundly for the handling of the Word of God, pay attention to what's going on. Don't say, oh, but what, what about this guy over here? Isn't he okay? And what about this guy? Listen to what they're saying. If you choose to expose yourself to that, listen to what's being said. If it comes under the Word of God and it aligns with the Word of God, then listen. And if it doesn't, if it's even slightly blurred, listen to the blur blurring of Hananiah. Two years slightly blurred. He's saying something similar, sounds like. Isn't that what Satan's best mastery is? Similar sounding to get you and I to follow down the wrong path. So as I begin this journey, and it's just a foundational message, I'm looking for uncommon men and women who are looking to learn about God and follow me as I follow Christ. And once having seen the light or the straight stick, that's your direction. You're not being swayed with every wind of doctrine, with every new idea. Oh, that sounds great over there. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I pray this helps clarify and illuminate for some. For others, it reaffirms. And for some, it may be the day you say, I don't care to listen to Pastor Scott anymore because I like this guy over here. Maybe it's a little bit like this, but I like this. Well, then go listen. And when you fall in the ditch, and you will fall in the ditch, don't say you weren't warned. That's the prophet side of me saying, you still have time to make your turn back to God and get right with Him. And it starts today with the word I just delivered. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.